Today on At the Forefront, we're going to discuss COPD and advanced emphysema and the toll it takes on your lungs. We'll discuss some of the exciting treatments that are increasing lifespans and quality of life for people who are suffering. That's coming up right now on At the Forefront. And we want to remind our guests that today's program is not designed to take the place of a visit with your physician. We're going to have to start off with having each one of you introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about what you do here at UChicago Medicine. You both have been on, uh, you're both veterans of, uh, <laughs> of the program. In fact, we were talking before the show, Dr. Hogarth, you were actually on the very first program. So right. I appreciate you being back. Tell us a little bit about your role here at UChicago Medicine. Uh, sure. My name is Kyle Hogarth. I'm a professor of medicine and I'm a pulmonologist. And I help run our interventional pulmonary program. So I, with my colleagues, we do procedures inside people's lungs to either help them breathe better or to diagnose whatever might be you know, wrong on the inside, whether that's lymph nodes or lung nodules. And as Jay, we're gonna go over to the corner with you. We're still doing our, our social distancing, so you're <laughs> a little ways away from us. Tell us a little bit about your, your role here at UChicago. Medicine. Sure, uh, my name is Jay Wog. I'm an interventional pulmonologist. Uh, I've been here at the University of Chicago now coming up on three years. Uh, working with Dr. Hogarth and Dr. Mergu, and uh, we offer minimally invasive strategies to help people breathe and uh, diagnose and treat lung conditions. And I'm excited to be part of the team. Great. And you guys have had some. You do a lot of uh, a lot of different procedures to folks' lungs, yeah. and a lot of exciting things. And and one of the things we're going to talk about today are our valves. But before we get into that, I want to know if you can just tell us a little bit about why you do those procedures and, and what kind of a, a patient are you you're looking at there and dr hogarth let's let's start with you if we can yeah sure so look there's there's there are a lot of people with with bad copd and emphysema and majority of it an inhaler that your doctor's prescribed is typically enough to minimize the symptoms and give you back you know less symptoms when you want to go walk places or do things but there are a significant amount of people whose lung disease is severe enough that their emphysema is bad enough that even though they've done everything their doctors asked them to do and they're taking the inhalers, et cetera, when you ask them to do any amount of walking or any amount of activities, they run into problems. And sometimes it's even the simple things like getting around your home or being able to run errands or the simple, hey, I want to go to the corner store. It doesn't matter. They're limited. And so they have to slow down their lifestyle. They have to adjust their lifestyle. And when they talk to their doctor about it, the, unfortunately, there's no other inhalers to try. There are no other drugs to try. So that's where procedures come in to offer up a chance. That we'll, we'll talk later about the workup for this, but to specifically help uh, these patients breathe better. And, and Dr. Wag, what exactly happens to your lungs when you are experiencing advanced emphysema or, or COPD? There's quite a bit of damage that's been done at that point. Is that correct? Yes, sir. So, you know, there's definitely damage. Uh, they, there can be damage to the lung tissue itself. Uh, there can be damage to the airways. Uh, when we think about advanced emphysema, we really think about damage to the lung tissue. And COPD is, you know, obstructive lung disease, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And it's really hard for that tissue to get the air out. We call that air trapping. And that's the main problem that we focus on with uh, our uh, special procedure. Great. And so let's talk a little bit about that uh, procedure. And, and, and first of all, uh, if, if you can tell us when a patient comes to you and they're experiencing these these difficulties, I imagine there's a whole a whole slew of things you probably look at and, yeah. and try. Kind of w w walk us through that, if you will. So on on the assumption that you've already been on the correct medications, quit smoking, and done something called pulmonary rehab to get your reconditioning, because those those are the core things that everyone should be doing. Be on the appropriate guideline-based medications that you're taking daily. Finish pulmonary rehabilitation so that you can maximize your exercise and obviously quit smoking and, and not be around secondhand smoke. So then if you're still symptomatic and still limited, that's when we initiate the workup to see if you're a candidate for these valves. Um, we'll need breathing tests to quantify and measure just how bad your lungs are, to quantify how bad that gas trapping that Dr. Wong just talked about, how hyperinflated you are. And then a specialized CT scan of the lungs to quantify and measure the degree of your emphysema so that we know just how bad it is because these valves, we've got to know where to place them. And so the scan we do helps to pinpoint the correct spot to place these devices so we maximize the benefit. And, and when you're talking about these valves, I imagine they've, they've got to be tiny. They are quite tiny. What, what, where do they go and, and what, do they, what do they look like? What, how do you 
place something like this? So we place it through a bronchoscope. So that's why Dr. Wag and I are involved. Um, you're, it's done under anesthesia, so you are asleep for it. We go through your mouth, there is no cutting. This is the beautiful thing about it. Yeah. So we go down into the airways that are the ones that we said from the CAT scan is where the bad part of the lung is. And I, there, think of these things as a one-way valve or a, a cork with an exit. So in other words, we're gonna plug up the sick part of the lung. We're gonna let the air out of that part of the lung. And what's pretty unique about the University of Chicago, so there's actually two different valve manufacturers in the market that make these devices. And they're, they're similar and yet different, and they have their pros and cons to each of them. And we are one of the only hospitals in the country that stock both and have the ability to use both in some very unique scenarios. We even have patients who have both inside them. Um, so it wasn't a pick one procedure. What, what, what matters is, is that you need to be able to get these valves in the correct airways, and I can't be limited based on some nuance to your anatomy or a nuance to these valves. And so I think that's, again, one of the unique things about an institution like ours is that they afford us the ability to ensure that we can take care of anyone who's remotely a candidate for this procedure. That is, that's, that's an amazing fact. And I, I think if we can touch on that just a little bit more. So when you're working with a patient, is that something you know before you do the procedure that they're going to need nope. these? Or is it once you get in there? No, it's a great around? question. I know Jay will agree <laughs> with me. Um, it, it's the unpleasant surprise that uh, the valves that you, you know, if you have only one company's valves on the shelf and you sit there and go, I'm not sure how this is going to work. And I can't think of anything worse than saying, I'm going to wake you up, you got to go home and you got to come back so I can because you know, we ordered the other one we needed. Um, you know, so it's an, and it's quite literally an on-the-fly measurement because they were taking active measurements on the inside, and that's how we figure this out. And it's not a common occurrence, but as, if it's more than one in a million, it's common enough. So. Yeah, exactly. I, and if you're if you're the, per, the patient that's exactly. going through the procedure, you you want that uh, variety available. Yeah, and you'd like to be only knocked out once, not yeah. multiple times. <laughs> Wait, and Dr. Wag, I'm kind of curious. Let's let's bring you into the conversation. What is that process like when you're doing the work and you see, okay, I need this and this, and you start to to work through the process with the patient? It's got to be gratifying, first of all, that you can you can offer that. Yeah. And and what's the then? I think if we can, let's talk a little bit about the. Uh, the rehab for the patient afterwards. Absolutely. So, you know, as part of the workup, you know, we would generally get a referral from uh, a lung specialist uh, of the patient uh, who would like uh, for us to evaluate the patient for this uh, procedure. And uh, as Dr. Hogarth mentioned, we look at the breathing tests. Uh, we look at the patient's ability to walk and their functional capacity. We want to ensure that the patient has quit smoking for about four months. Um, and we also look at uh, their CAT scan and, and send that for a special report uh, so that we can assess certain criteria uh, on the CAT scan. And we want to do all of this stuff before uh, we bring the patient back for the actual procedure to ensure that they're a good candidate for the procedure. And how long does a procedure like this take, generally? The, the actual procedure is quite short, uh, less than an hour uh, on most occasions. Yeah, and it usually ends up averaging about 30 minutes. Wow. Yeah. Okay. I would have I would have anticipated much much more significant than that. Yeah. No. It's 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 pretty incredible. And does the patient what what is it the 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 impact to the patient? Is it immediate? And how do they feel afterwards? I'll, I'll let Jay address that one. Um, so it depends. Uh, just like most things medically or many things medically, uh, I think some patients definitely uh, see uh, some benefit quite early on. But it could take actually several weeks to see a full benefit. And at that point in time, around six weeks or so, we ask the patient to come back for a new breathing test and a new scan to really assess objectively whether or not they've benefited. And I would imagine that if, if that portion of the lung, your lungs, you're, you're taking that pressure off and taking the air out, right. does the, do the rest of the lungs then have to kind of build and grow and well, yeah, that, yeah. well, in fact, that's the whole reason these things work. Okay. You've got the sick part of your lung is not only does it not work well, it's gotten very enlarged and it's actually squishing the healthy parts. That's the easiest way to think about it. And it's shoving your diaphragm down. So when I ask you to take a deep breath, you already are at rest. So you're breathless because you can't go deeper. Yeah. So if we deflate you, then the healthier parts of your lung are able to expand and do more work. And it's, it's, it's not the same, but it's similar to cutting off the branch of a tree that's dead, and you cut the dead branch off, and then the rest of the tree expands in, you know, a couple weeks later, and the tree looks beautiful again, and you can't even tell it had a dead branch. Yeah. Very similar. 
So just, a, I would imagine, a tremendous... But without cutting. Yeah. <laughs> We're not cutting any branches off. But, but I would imagine it's, it's a tremendous uh, quality of life change for these patients. You know, when you can't breathe, nothing else matters. Yeah. Right? And to restore even a little bit of a lung function, for people to be able to have the freedom to be able to go, you know, grocery shopping again. Um, you know, one of my patients was very frustrated. She's an older lady. Um, uh, the younger tennis players were beating her on the tennis court. <laughs> she was in great shape, but still had limits. Yeah. And now she's back to beating the younger tennis players. So, <laughs> well, that's that's exciting news. Let's talk a little bit about smoking too, because I yeah. know that's that's central to to the issue that happens here. Or oftentimes, it is. Is that primarily what you see in your patients, or can it be a whole slew of of different reasons that they get to this stage? Well, typically, we uh, see patients who have this uh, problem as a result of smoking. So. Uh, you know, we want to encourage, or we continue to encourage patients to quit smoking, and it is something that we look for uh, prior to proceeding with such a procedure. I've always been kind of curious, if, if, if somebody is a smoker and has been a smoker for a while, they've obviously done some damage to their lungs. If they stop while they're still in a somewhat healthy stage, do the lungs regenerate at all, or are you pretty much have done the damage? No, the lungs don't regenerate. So, you know, I tell people the reason to quit smoking or never to start is your lungs are the bank account that you only draw money from and you never add to. Yeah. The medications make the lungs work more efficiently. This, this treatment, these valves, help to make the lungs work more efficiently. But the damage, unfortunately, is damage done. Um, and the only way to keep that from getting worse is to quit smoking. Yeah, that's, a, that's just a great reminder to, to people that may be watching. And uh, vaping too, and by the way, all smoke. Yeah. So with legalized marijuana, smoke is smoke. Your lungs don't care. Smoke is smoke. Everything damages your lungs when you put it in there, so don't. You know, I, I'm glad you brought that up because that, that's, that's another huge issue currently. I mean, right. particularly here in uh, Illinois, we, we see the legalization and, and we see so many people vaping. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of people are under the misperception that vaping isn't bad for you. Right, that it's somehow safer. Yeah. You know, I think it, this is a sh moving target. I think Jay would agree with me. It's, um, um, and, and, you know, you'll hear people say, well, it's got to be safer. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess it's safer to get hit by a car than it is to get hit by a bus. Um, I'm going to just not get hit by either vehicle yeah. is really the analogy I would use. You know, both sound like a really bad idea. I don't know. Jay, you would yeah. agree? I, I, absolutely. <laughs> we just want to breathe in clean air. So, yeah. I mean, if, exactly. uh, that's what our recommendation would be uh, to, to focus on breathing clean air and, and, and focus on our environment and uh, you know, emphasize clean air in, in, in our environment as well. So, uh, yeah, I mean, that we, we don't want to encourage anybody to put anything in their lungs other than clean air. Well, that's what our lungs are built for. They're not built to right. inhale smoke and other garbage. <laughs> Correct. Great. So, um, so, so there is some hope out there for folks with COPD or, or uh, significant uh, emphysema. So that's, that's positive. If the valves don't work, there's, there are other options as well that uh, you all offer. Well, there are. So I think this is where it's unique. So Jay and I, so Dr. Wong and I are very involved in several different uh, clinical trials that are also looking at ways to help people with emphysema. So there will be uh, ways to make the valves work more effectively in some people where they aren't possible. And there are uh, multiple other medical devices under varying levels of investigation. So they're not available yet. But this is why you, large teaching hospitals and research hospitals like ours exist precisely because at one point valves were experimental, and yet we were doing them as part of the trial. And when they became FDA approved, we were one of the first sites and, and were the first site in Illinois to offer this, this procedure. It should be noted, and probably not surprising, Dr. Wag and I have done more of these procedures than anyone in about a couple hundred miles, maybe it's about 400 mile radius around Chicago. Um, so we have the largest experience, the largest ability to care for these patients and how to better expedite the workup. Um, and then you're right, if, if somehow you're not a candidate for these device or any of the other ones coming down the pipeline, the certain patients are candidates for the, a surgical approach to this. And then obviously we always have transplant as some level of availability. They have their own rules and workup, obviously. Mm -hmm. But, um, and I always tell all my patients, don't let your doctor assume that you're a transplant candidate or not. Wait till a transplant doctor says you're not a candidate. Yep. Because the rules in transplant are changing as well. And so you may be at least worth finding out if, yeah. if you have no other options. Yeah, one of the, uh, these are actually multiple benefits of, of uh, an institution like UChicago Medicine, Academic Medical Center, 
research hospital. You guys do clinical trials. All of the all of those exciting things that, that don't happen necessarily at, at other institutions. Dr. White? would would like to add one more thing, that the yeah. valves are not prohibitive for uh, surgical or transplant evaluation That's as well. So you can still undergo valves and still undergo those other evaluations as well. So one of the other things that I think is pretty unique about the University of Chicago is, look, people get CT scans of their chest for many different reasons. And you know, the, the scan will get read and evaluated by the doctors and, and you know, thankfully it doesn't have a lung nodule or maybe that's, you know, maybe that's why they did it. But there's a whole lot of other wealth of information hidden inside that CAT scan if only we were asking the specific questions. So you keep hearing in the news about things like artificial intelligence and various things being auto-read and algorithms, etc. So we utilize a very unique software made by a company called Imbio and what it does is in the background, it's reading every single CT scan done here to look for the degree of emphysema you have and flag whether you may be a candidate for these valves. So the flip side of it is maybe you yet haven't even talked to your doctor about being short of breath or having limits, but we're gonna flag and say, you know what, you're potentially a candidate for this. And look, you, you may not need them, you, you may be breathing just fine, but we are gonna try to capture more people who would potentially benefit and could breathe better. I, I literally saw a gentleman this morning who you know, was not doing great with his breathing, but just kind of thought that's how life was. And we, he had a CT for another reason, we found it, and now we saw him and he's gonna get this procedure in two weeks. Wow, that's fantastic. So Jay, you've been leading this project. Yes, um, sir. We can talk more about it. Yeah, absolutely, Dr. Hogarth. I mean, I think uh, it's wonderful to be able to offer uh, you know, a specialized care for patients who may or may not even be aware of, of the possibility. And, and we're uh, actively communicating with uh, other physicians, ensuring that they're aware of this. And should a patient's scan get flagged, we're in conversations with those uh, other physicians to see if potentially uh, those patients may be a candidate and that they could potentially have that conversation with their doctor or uh, even have a visit with us. And we would certainly be happy to uh, have that conversation uh, with the patient as well. Uh, so we've, uh, you know, begun to identify several patients uh, that may be good candidates, and we're out uh, actually now discussing with those doctors uh, who were the ordering providers. All right, we're going to take a, a quick break. When we come back, we'll have a couple of uh, other physicians join us to talk about some of the surgical options. Stay with us. We'll be back uh, in just a moment. And welcome back. We have two different doctors with us for this portion of the program, Dr. Renee Jablonski and Dr. Lucia. Matariago, join us to talk a little bit more about COPD and advanced emphysema and what all of that uh, can do to a person and some things that you can do if you, uh, if you have that condition. And I, I want to start off and talk a little bit more about COPD, COPD and advanced emphysema. We, we discussed it in the first portion of the program, but the, the question I have now, I guess, is what is the difference between the two and how do, how are they, uh, how do they interact? So I'm Renee Jablonski. I'm one of the pulmonologists that I work with the lung transplant program here. So COPD is a condition that has, it's uh, an umbrella term to cover two different diseases. Emphysema, which is a term to describe a process where there's destruction of the lung tissue, and chronic bronchitis, which is uh, a condition that's mostly um, uh, uh, involving more inflammation in the air tubes and the lungs, causing a chronic cough. So we're here today to talk about procedures that can be done for that subset of patients who have that emphysema subset mm. of COPD. And they're both pretty significant issues though for patients and, and, and very serious, uh, particularly from a quality of life standpoint, but even um, longevity, is it? Would that be accurate? That's correct. And we know that the more advanced your lung function decline is with COPD, the likely shorter your life expectancy might be. When we meet patients with COPD, we'll also often look for other things like evidence that your lungs are putting more stress on your heart um, or that your lungs are not doing an adequate job, either getting oxygen into your body or CO2 out of your body. Um, as those can also be markers that your risk of death might be higher with this condition. Dr. Matariaga, Mater, I'm sorry, 
uh, didn't give you an opportunity to, to introduce yourself. I, I, I went right over that portion of it, and I apologize for that. So tell us a little bit about what you do here at U Chicago Medicine. Yes, my name is Luthia Marariaga, and I'm a general thoracic surgeon and lung transplant surgeon here at U Chicago. I take care of many patients with advanced emphysema. So let's talk a little bit about lung volume reduction surgery. We talked about valves in the first part of the program, but lung volume reduction surgery is is kind of the, I guess, the, the next step uh, in 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 this treatment uh, or next treatment option, I guess you could say. Um, what exactly is that and, and what does that entail? And, and Dr. Madariaga, I'm sorry, um, let's go to you on that one. Sure, so lung volume reduction surgery, the point of the operation is to remove the unhealthy upper part of the lung so that the lower part of the lung, which is more normal, can do its work of breathing and helping the patient feel better. And the way we do the surgery here is we do it through a minimally invasive technique, meaning we use three small incisions, about one inch in size, um, and we do both sides at the same time. And after the operation, the patient stays in the hospital for a bit and is able to go home. When you say uh, minimally invasive, is that kind of a robotic type thing, or is there another way that you do that? Um, we have different techniques. So we use thoroscopic techniques, which is with the camera, uh, but it can also be done robotically as well. And when a patient, so, so describe that to me. When you, uh, when you work on the lungs for the patient, what exactly are you doing and, and what, is, what is the patient experiencing at that point that, that needs the, why, why do they need the LVRS? Yeah, so in advanced emphysema that qualifies for lung volume reduction surgery, most of the destroyed part of the lung is in the upper part of the lung. And so the theory behind this operation is if we remove that part of the lung, the upper part which is destroyed, then the more normal part of the lung, which is the lower part of the lung, can fill up the space and work better for the patient. And is this something that a patient has a pretty quick uh, reaction to afterwards? Yes, yeah, so most patients, um, we go through a very rigorous selection process to make sure that the patients we offer this procedure on will actually get some quality of life and breathing benefit. So that after the surgery, they can notice that their breathing feels better. Um, of course, there's a recovery period from surgery because we do make an incision. And after the patient works through that, keeps up with exercise, perhaps going to pulmonary rehab, I think most patients feel like they can breathe better and have better quality of life. Dr. Polanski, how do patients, when they, when they come to see you, um, how, how do they know that they're at that level that they need the help? I, I'm assuming they're referred to you probably by another, maybe their primary care physician or someone else, but how do they know that they're that far along that they, they, they need this level of help? Some patients ask their physicians or their care providers for a referral, and then you're right, some patients are also referred to us often by their primary lung doctor uh, or pulmonologist, less frequently by their primary care doctor. And usually they're coming to us to ask for more help because they're so limited by their lungs and the, their difficulty breathing that they can't do and enjoy the quality of life that they would like to be enjoying. When, when you talk about how limited they are, are these folks that, that can't walk up a flight of stairs usually or? Frequently, or, yes, yeah. yes. Have trouble walking up a flight of stairs, have trouble even doing things like cooking a meal or getting dressed because it's so difficult for them to breathe. And I would imagine if you're to that stage, that has to have an impact on your heart as well, doesn't it? I mean, you're, isn't your heart working harder and uh, to, to try to pump blood at that point too? It can, and we see in some patients with advanced lung disease that it can put more stress on the heart. As part of the evaluation for any of these procedures that we're talking about today, we do ensure that the patient's heart is healthy enough to undergo whatever procedure we think might be right for their emphysema. Is there a point where people think about a, a lung transplant maybe to, to, to take care of this problem, or is that, is that completely out of the, the norm? Yes, sometimes we do think about a lung transplant for patients with advanced emphysema. We know that with either the valve procedure or with the lung volume reduction surgery, that there are a subset of patients whose lungs are just too sick to qualify for one of these procedures, or some patients in whom we do see that extra stress that's put on the heart by the lung disease. And those are patients with, with whom we start to have those difficult talks about whether transplant might be the right option for them. And I know we have a new machine. I, I've seen this, and this is totally off topic, but I'm, I, 
I'm just fascinated by this, for uh, lung transplants that helps keep the lungs active and alive longer. So we actually have increased our transplant, I guess, halo for lungs, which is uh, it's pretty good news for patients. That's, that's pretty exciting. So how does somebody get referred to the program? So we are, uh, have a streamlined process now with our advanced emphysema program where patients can, with one referral, come and see all three of our groups to decide which procedure might be best for them. And we have a website uh, linked to the University of Chicago website that has information about who to call so that you can get an appointment with us. Dr. Matariaga, I know you alluded to this a moment ago, but how much better does a patient feel once they have one of these procedures and, and, and how quickly do they feel better? I just, I love hearing about this. Yeah, so um, in general, I would say that patients feel about 30 to 40% better in terms of their breathing. But I think it's important to qualify not in terms of numbers, but in terms of what they actually want to accomplish after surgery. For example, one of my patients, he wanted to garden and cut roses for his wife and take out the trash. And then with his recovery after surgery, um, he was able to exercise and recover to the point where he is able to do those sort of things. So for each patient, we need to decide what makes up your quality of life and, and what would you like to do afterwards that we can help you with. After you have the operation, you basically stay in the hospital for about five to seven days. Um, these patients are uh, tend to be on the sicker side, so we just want to be very careful before sending you home that you are fully recovered from that standpoint. And we do do an operation, so it takes maybe one to two weeks to feel a little bit recovered from your incisions, but we expect you to be able to walk as soon as surgery is over, and walking every single day and getting back to a normal exercise routine really accelerates your recovery. And I would imagine, you know, when, when people get that quality of life back, that's just, I mean, that's just such a huge thing. And uh, you, you probably hear from a lot of happy patients and happy families, and uh, uh, it's gotta be very rewarding. Yes, it's very nice to see the trajectory of patients feeling much better after surgery, that they're able to do the things that they want to do. That's great. And we said it in the first segment of the program, and I, I just can't hammer this home enough, don't smoke. Uh, if you are a smoker, stop smoking. That's just, that's so critical. And, and I would imagine most of the patients uh, you all see are probably former smokers. And it's just, it just has to, has to resonate so much with, with you. Yes, and we're here to help you quit smoking if that's something that you're interested in doing. That's great. All right, we are out of time. We really appreciate uh, the two of you being on the program today. That was great information. Special thanks to all of our guests for being with us today. And a big thank you to those of you who watched the program. To make an appointment, you can go online to uchicagomedicine.org. You can also check out our website and find just all kinds of great information on, uh, on, on this program and others. Or give us a call at 888-824-0200. Thanks again for being with us today, and I hope everyone has a great week.